happy day and welcome everyone. What we're going to be doing today is introducing equilibrium to you. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the notes and then we're going to do a quick little focus on Le Chatelier's principle. So on this first page we are just talking about the basics of equilibrium, just kind of getting an idea of what it means and what it is. We'll be looking into Le Chatelier's principles. So there's a picture of Le Chatelier right there. Uh, we will be doing a demonstration today just to kind of um, give you an idea of what happens with this pink blue switcheroo. It's kind of a, a cool uh, little demo to do. And um, again, more Le Chatelier, just kind of practicing a little bit with Le Chatelier's principle. And then we'll talk about equilibrium constants and K, which we've already talked about before. But now we're going to talk a little bit about relating it to pressure versus concentration. And there's an equation that we can use in order to relate those. Writing equilibrium expressions, we've already done that, which is really nice. So a lot of this is, is review. The next thing is if you take a look at this page here, as well as the next page, it's a lot of problem solving. That's all it is. We're going to be doing a lot of practice problems together. So a lot of the learning so far hasn't been anything new, really. So until we get to the problem solving, that's probably where a lot of the new stuff is going to be coming in with the math. A little bit with the quadratic equation, which I put in a little disclaimer. I've never seen any AP question relating to the use of it, but it's good to know anyway and how to use it. Uh, Q and K. We've already done Q versus K. So that's really nice also. Um, and then summing up equilibrium. Okay, uh, sample problem. And this here is solubility product, KSP. This is actually from chapter 17.4, but it, uh, it fits in a lot better here with equilibrium since it is talking about the equilibrium product constant, but specifically for solubility. So that's how we're gonna end the unit is talking about KSP. And again, if you look this entire page, do you really see notes? Not really. It's problem solving. So it's a lot of just sample problems. So yeah, there are a little bit of notes on top here, but you'll see that most of this unit is all about sample problems. And so let's get right to it and let's come right back and talk about Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so we already know this. Chemical reactions are gonna be written as REC is how I refer to it. So it's R, your arrow, and your P, your products. Although there are reactions that you can flip, we call them reversible. Meaning that the reactions can go simultaneously in both directions and it's indicated with a double arrow. So you can see this double arrow that's written right here. So let's start with the forward reaction. So sulfur dioxide is going to react with the oxygen and it's going to form sulfur trioxide. Well, at the beginning of the reaction, what do we think? How much SO3 is there? Well, SO3 is a product. And so at the beginning, time zero, we shouldn't have any. So if we come over to time zero over here, we should say that there is zero of the SO3. So I'm going to put down my concentration of SO3 down here. My SO2, I can see has a coefficient of two versus what would be a one on my oxygen. So I should have, if I'm reacting it the way that the reaction wants me to react it, I should have double the amount of moles of my SO2. So I'm gonna put my concentration of SO2 here at the beginning. I'm gonna put my O2 concentration here. Now, we don't really know that to be true. So you could really start and load up your flask with whatever you want and how much you want. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of that. I could start with products and not any reactants. With kinetics, we always said the reactants are it. You start with the reactants, you only look at the rate of the reactants, but it is different when we're talking about equilibrium. So your reaction could go both ways. And by the way, this is kind of weird. You could actually start with your reactants and products inside of the flask in equilibrium. All right, so what's gonna happen over time? Well, we don't necessarily know where equilibrium is, but we do know that our SO2 and our O2 should decrease over time, because those are our reactants, if I tell you that that's what we're starting with, and our SO3 should be increasing over time. So I'm going to tell you that when it reaches equilibrium, the concentration of the SO3 is here. So go ahead and mark that. So I'm going to call this my initial I, initial I, and initial I at time zero, or some people will say time zero. After some time, but I'm gonna actually say that it's reached equilibrium, and we're gonna uh, talk about what this means uh, to be at equilibrium. The SO3 is going to be a little bit higher, 
if I told you that the SO2 concentration was here at equilibrium, what would you tell me about the O2 concentration? Well, let's actually use a different color in a second here. So I'm gonna kind of do a line that kind of goes down here. Well, since I only have half, if one of the SO2 or three in this case reacted moles, then I should have uh, half of that that actually is left over as well for the O2. So I'm gonna look at something like this at equilibrium for my oxygen. For my SO3, I'm doing a different color here just so that we can see that this should be increasing over time since that is my product. Now, if you remember, we said that equilibrium was not a point where my reaction actually stops. It's incorrect to say it stops. We say that the reaction has reached a point where there is no net change. Okay, so when you are at equilibrium, we're gonna say that there is no net change. And we're gonna wanna remember that, okay? All right, so now let's say that you were given the first situation and you were asked to do the reverse situation. Okay, which is that you start with sulfur trioxide and the sulfur trioxide is gonna decompose into oxygen and sulfur dioxide. So now we're gonna do this backwards. So let's put our SO2 and our O2 at zero. Initial, initial. So we're gonna call those our initial. Now our SO3 should actually be up here. And that's our I for initial again. Okay. Well, we're going to wait for it to come to equilibrium. What can you tell me about equilibrium? Hopefully you said that the equilibrium concentration should be the same whether I start forward or I start backwards or I start with a mix of reactants and products. It doesn't really matter. So whatever I had over on the right side here, meaning my SO should be here at the same point. My O2 at equilibrium should be right there. And then my SO3, do that in a different color. Oh, let's get this here first. So my SO2 is going to increase there. My O2 is going to increase there. And now let's switch our color here. And let's get our SO3 concentration at equilibrium right there. So again, what we said was our equilibrium concentrations need to match no matter which direction that we're going in. Okay. So chemical equilibrium is a state in which the forward and the reverse reactions are taking place at the same rate. There's no net change. So just like we said, no net change. A reaction may favor a certain formation. The equilibrium position is going to indicate whether the reactants are at a higher concentration or the products are at a higher concentration once you're at equilibrium. The reactants or products are at a higher concentration at equilibrium. Okay, and that's what they're gonna mean by which one's being favored, okay? So there, if you see this A to B, and if there's more of B, which they're saying that 99% is a B, the formation of B, we would say, is favored. So the longer of the two arrows is simply going to indicate the favored direction. And favored simply means that you have more of it, there's a higher concentration of it at equilibrium. There's a higher or greater concentration at equilibrium. Okay, so the effect of a catalyst, the catalyst actually doesn't affect equilibrium. All you do is you simply get there faster. So do not affect the amount of reactants and products. They reach equilibrium sooner. Reach equilibrium concentrations faster. That's it. It just decreases the time that it takes. Okay. So the factors affecting equilibrium, this is called Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to circle the letter C, T, and P. And so I'm actually gonna call this 
Le CTP. Now in kinetics, we said concentration, catalyst, temperature, and particle size. But now for equilibrium, concentration is the C, T is temperature, but now P is pressure. And I want you to keep in mind that if they don't mention anything about volume, remember that pressure and volume should be of a gas. And as your pressure increases, your volume should decrease. And so we say that they're inversely related. Remember when we did PV over T and we said that pressure and volume would be inversely related to each other for a gas. Okay. So Le Chalier's principle states, when stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the system will shift to relieve stress, just like we do. So if a certain stress is applied to you, your body naturally wants to relieve that stress. So if you're doing something that's very physical, you actually wanna to try to do something that's the opposite. So maybe listening to music, maybe just chilling for a minute, um, but you always wanna to try to relieve that stress. If somebody pushes down on your shoulders, you actually wanna do whatever it is that's gonna relieve that stress. So the system shifts to relieve stress. And what are those stresses? So those stresses we said are if you change the concentration, if you change the temperature, if you change the pressure or the volume. And remember again, those are gonna be inversely related. Okay, so the following reactions are reversible, although we're gonna take the components on the left to be the reactants, on the right to be the products, always. So we're gonna always do wrap, reactants, arrow, products. Uh, the arrow always points toward the favorite side, so the equilibrium shift compensates for the stress that caused it. So if they tell you what it is, you can look at the way that the arrow is shifting. Or they'll have a double arrow like they do here, where the one that's longer is the side that's being favored. Uh, concentration. So if you change the amount of any reactant or product in the system, it will disturb equilibrium. So our bodies naturally will actually have a certain amount of equilibrium between the amount of carbonic acid and carbon dioxide that is in our blood. And it happens to be that it is a 1% carbonic acid and about 99% of the carbon dioxide and the water side, okay? And so what it does is it maintains this equilibrium between carbon dioxide and H2CO3. Now, when we exercise, we rapidly exhale what that feeds the plants. Did you say carbon dioxide? So CO2 would be the correct answer. Well, if you lose too much CO2, your blood wants to actually replace it so that it comes back to that that uh, whatever equilibrium, wherever equilibrium sits. And so what it will do is it'll turn the carbonic acid into carbon dioxide to replace it. But what if there's too much carbon dioxide in your blood? If there's too much carbon dioxide, your reaction will actually shift in the back in the opposite direction and it will form more carbon carbonic acid. So it'll reduce the carbon dioxide and go back to carbonic acid. So it can keep on going back and forth depending on what our, where our equilibrium sits. So as soon as, if there's too much carbon dioxide, so let's say that there's too much carbon dioxide in our blood, it will react with water. Don't forget, these are both our products. And if they're both our products, as one of them is depleted, the other one's depleted as well. Or as one of them increases, the other one has to be increasing as well. So keep that in mind, unless they're only adding carbon dioxide into a flask, for example, okay? So if carbon dioxide is added, it's gonna react with water and it should form more of the carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. Now, I do wanna make sure that you remember this. Carbonic acid doesn't actually stay as carbonic acid, which is why we had said at the beginning of the year, when we did a reaction and we did, it was called pop the top, and we reacted vinegar with, which is acetic acid, with baking soda. One of the products was carbonic acid, but the carbonic acid doesn't stay that way. It forms carbon dioxide and water. And so what we saw was the CO2 buildup and that was bubbles and then it popped the top off. And so something that's actually you know, important or, or uh, helpful to remember. So this is kind of the second time that it's coming up. So adding a product or removing a reactant will always, 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 if you add a product, it's gonna shift in the opposite direction and we're gonna say will favor the reactants. In other words, we will make more reactants until it comes back to equilibrium.
so um, we're going to say, let's put a semicolon here. We will make more reactants until equilibrium is reached again. All right, until we get to the point where uh, we're equal percentage-wise or molarity-wise um, on both sides. If you remove a product and you take something away, or if you add a reactant, I'll talk about that in just a second. So if you take something away, you actually want to put it back. So if you take it away, put it back on the same side. So removing a product always favors the products. In other words, you'll make more product until you go, come back to equilibrium again. Make more products until equilibrium is reached or attained again. Okay, so uh, the key to remember is if you add to one side, it's going to shift the opposite side. If you take something away, put it back on the same side that you got it from until you get equilibrium again. So I have a little bit of a um, quick little analogy, so I don't know if you know this, but farmers will try to increase the yield of eggs. And the way that they do this is, yes, there are some like very unnatural ways to do it, but one of the ways that you can do it is you can take the eggs away. So the hen comes over and the hen sits down and lays some eggs and you get the hen to walk away and then you move the eggs, you take the eggs away. Hen comes back and says, what happened to my eggs? Lays more eggs. And so you can actually increase the yield pretty naturally um, doing it that way. So what will uh, when will concentration alter equilibrium? Anytime you change the concentration, but we're gonna specify this. If equilibrium is changed, remember, solids and liquids are not uh, going to be phased by this for gases or aqueous substances. So keep in mind, if it's solid or if it's liquid, equilibrium is not affected um, when you change the concentration of your solid or your liquid, for the most part. If you add more of a reactant, we said it's going to shift to make more of the products because there's too much reactant. So too much on the reactant side. So it's going to shift to the right towards the products. Okay, and what if you take something away? So if I take it away, it's actually going to shift to the products again because if I remove a product, it appears as if the ratio of the reactants, there's too much reactant to product. So again, we're going to favor our product and it's going to shift right. So again, it's too much of the reactants, just like we said before. So again, it will shift to the right, make more products. Again, until you reach equilibrium. Okay. Um, I did like this. This is um, just a little blurb about uh, Le Chatelier that I thought was a little bit interesting. So over here, um, these are the different stresses and the shifts and why it happens. Um, so we already talked about the different things here. But he was born in 1850 in Paris. Um, he was the son of actually a very famous engineer at the time. And he was in the aluminum industry and had come up with um, some methods. But uh, I, I kind of like this quote here that Le Chatelier had stated, I was accustomed to a very strict discipline. It was necessary to wake up on time prepare for your duties and your lessons, eat everything on your plate, etc. All my life I maintained respect for order and law. Order is one of the most perfect forms of civiliz civilization, which is kind of cool because he's all about like, if you do this, then this happens. If you do this, then that happens. And so it was kind of cool to see how that actually applied uh, to his principle. Okay, so I'm going to introduce this uh, very popular demo called the pink blue switcheroo. And so I have this complex molecule in here, actually they call it a complex ion. So you can see this cobalt water, it actually does have chlorine as well in it. And this, let me enlarge this real quick so you can see here. So this is pink in color right now. And so what I'm gonna do is I have a hot plate over here. I am just going to set this up right on this hot plate. And then we are going to come back to it, but you definitely see that it's pink. I'm going to set it on the hot plate, and then I'm going to talk about it uh, for a second. I'll come right back to that, and, um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit.
Okay, so we just talked about what happens if you increase the concentration. The temperature is going to be exactly the same. So if we increase the temperature, it's always going to favor the opposite side from where the temperature, where the heat is, which means we need to know if it's exothermic or endothermic. So let's review that real quick. So if we have reactants, arrow products, if our heat is on the left side of the reaction, we would call this an endothermic reaction. And if it is endothermic, remember, that means that your delta H should be positive in sign, okay? So if they show you the heat inside of an equation, they will write it as maybe like 75 kilojoules or something like that. So for example, let's do an exothermic one. So let's say I had reactants, arrow, products, and then I said plus 75 kilocalories, for example. So what that would mean is, that would mean that my delta H is actually negative in sign. So if I did have this, I would say my delta H is negative 75 kcals, and this would be called an exothermic reaction in that case, okay? All right, so if you increase the temperature, it will shift in the direction that will relieve the stress, whatever the temperature stress is. That will relieve the stress the heat stress. So if it's exothermic, it's different from when it's endothermic, okay? All right, I have to show you something because this already um, happened and it's not even that hot, but I wanna show you what just happened on this hot plate. So um, let me go back to the picture here. So let's take this over here. Normally, I would say don't touch this, but um, so here's our reaction right here. What I did was I just added heat and I can see that it changed from pink to blue or this violet color. So let's enlarge this for a second. Definitely not pink anymore. Now we've got a very pretty blue color um, that we're seeing on here. And so what you could do is you could actually, now what I'm gonna show you is that, I know that water is a liquid, but I'm gonna show you what happens if I actually add some water to this. Okay, so I got my goggles on just in case I get any splattering. So I'm going to just add a little bit of water and then let's just give it a little bit of a mix here. And I'm gonna add a little bit more water. And honestly, like um, it's it, the way that the reaction is supposed to go is because it's a liquid, it shouldn't actually change if you add water, but it's doing two things. One, not now it's going to like almost like a, oh, you probably can't tell yet. It's gone to a purplish violet color already. And so I'm just adding a little bit more here. And yes, again, I am cooling it as I'm doing this as well, but it's definitely purple now and it's not blue anymore. And so I want to, I want to get this to go to a pink color. And then I'm going to show you one more thing um, once I get it to a pink color. Okay. All right. So it's almost there. Uh, again, it's hard for you to see, but it's definitely lighter in color now, so it's starting to go back to the pink color. I'm gonna come back to this in just a second and then we'll fill out um, the dots. So I'm gonna let it cool off just a second here, but the water is making it go back, again, because it's cooling it as well, but, um, but so we'll come right back to this. Okay, so in this example here, we have heat over here, which means that this must be an exothermic reaction. And so our delta H, if we had our delta H outside of it, it would be a negative sign for our delta H. So how does temperature uh, generally alter equilibrium? If it is an endo or an exothermic reaction, it will always shift in the direction either that you're going to relieve the stress. So whichever way relieves the heat stress. Um, it shifts to relieve the stress added, the heat stress added. What happens if you heat an exothermic reaction? So this reaction, if we add heat, we're actually adding to the product side. So think of it as like one of your reactants, even though it's not, or a product, right? Treat it as a substance. If I heat it, it's gonna shift opposite, which means it's gonna go backwards towards the reactants. Shifts left toward the reactants. Okay? And uh, what happens if you heat an endothermic reaction? Well, if it's endothermic and heat is on the left side, then my reaction is going to shift toward my products. It's going to shift to the right. In other words, towards the products. Okay. And now we've got pressure. 
So changing the pressure only affects a system if it has an unequal mole ratio. Unequal mole ratio. Of what? Well, obviously products to reactants. But I want to make sure that you remember this. We do not include solids. We do not include liquids. So when you add up, you actually want to make sure that you're not including those. And there's a statement that I always like to use for this. So what I like to say is more is less and less is more. Okay. What are we talking about? The moles. So always good to remember more pressure is less moles. Less pressure is more moles. So I say more is less or less is more. All right, you have a cylinder with a piston. You push the piston down and what happens to the pressure on the gases? That's gonna increase. And so it says the system wants to relieve the stress. Let's draw this out and I'm gonna have you uh, copy this down. Okay, so on the left side, this is our reaction by the way. We've got nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to make ammonia. And so we can see our moles here. So we can see that this is three moles and two moles, and if there's no number in front of it, that must be a one, okay? So I've got my original volume, and then I have my second volume where I've actually lowered this piston down. The system's gonna wanna relieve the stress, and so the question is, if, it doesn't even matter what I put inside of the flask, if I let it reach equilibrium, what does equilibrium look like in each one of these situations? So if I let it come to equilibrium, now what's gonna happen is, at volume number one, where I actually have more room and more space, in other words, my pressure is actually going to be less, right? So at a higher volume, so in this situation here, I have a higher volume, which means my pressure is lower, okay? My pressure is going to be less. Whereas in this situation, I actually have a lower volume, which means my pressure is higher, okay? And so what we want is we want to count the moles. Again, we don't include solids and liquids. We're only going to include gases and aqueous. And so I can see that in the, as long as my, as far as my balanced equation is concerned, the N2 and H2 totals out to be four moles, whereas my product side only equals two moles in total. So if I have a lower pressure, then I'm going to say less is more, or less pressure is more like we wrote up here in red. So I want the side with more, which means I'm going to favor the reactants, which is N2 plus 3H2. So if I analyze, I should see that I have more of the N2 and the 3H2s. Um, if that is what the, the cylinder looks like. Now in this situation where I've pushed my, uh, uh, my volume down, my piston down, then which side should be favored now? This side should favor the products, which means my two NH3s. And so what it's gonna look like is actually a, if you remember that NH3 has a lone pair of electrons on top, so it forms a pyramidal shape. But um, either way, we can just write NH3 and NH3. So it's gonna favor the side that has less moles, okay? So again, more is less and less is more. When we're talking about this, we're specifically focusing on pressure, but volume is going to be inverse of it. What do we say happens if you add a catalyst? How would it alter it? it doesn't change equilibrium, you just get there faster. Doesn't change equilibrium concentrations, although, equilibrium concentrations are reached or attained uh, at, a more, uh, at a faster rate or more quickly. More quickly. Okay. So now we've got some practice problems. Let's do the first one together and then I'm gonna have you do the other ones and then we'll pause and see how you did. So the first one says, how is the equilibrium position of this reaction affected? So I can see carbon solid. Ooh, let's like put a little slash through it. As soon as I see a solid, make sure you do that, okay? Heat doesn't really count, but this is endothermic. So if I lower the temperature, that's like removing heat. And if you remove it, you wanna put it back. So what side is that gonna favor? That should favor the reactant side, or you can say it should shift left, okay? 
So you can use either terminology for this. If you increase the pressure, I want you to think more is less, more pressure. We want the side with less moles. So I want to check to see which side has less moles. Well, on this side, I can see two moles, one plus one. And on this side, heat doesn't count and neither does the carbon solid. So it's actually only one mole. So which side has less moles? The reactants again. So we're gonna favor the reactants. In other words, it's gonna shift left again. What if we remove H2? Well, H2 is a product. So if I take it away, I wanna put it back. So it's gonna favor the products. Or again, we're gonna say now it shifts right to favor the products until we get equilibrium back. What if you add H2? Well, now there's too much on the product side. It's going to react with the carbon monoxide. So don't forget, as my H2 goes down, so does my CO. And it's going to form the carbon solid and the water, OK? So it will be forming everything on the reactant side. It's not like it's not forming that. So if I add H2, it's going to shift left again. Or you can say it favors the reactants. OK, so we've got reactants, reactants, favors products favors reactants, okay? All right, go ahead and try uh, these other three and let's see how you did. Okay, let's see how you did. Go ahead and check your answers and um, hopefully you got those all right. Let's go back real quick up to, I just added a letter E. Uh, what if you added carbon solid? You should say no effect. So if it's solid or liquid, you should say that the volume would actually uh, remain constant, that that's not going to really affect it. Okay, and one last thing, let's come back to our little demo that we were doing here. So now if I take a look, it is, oh, let's enlarge this real quick so you can see that I'm not, so we can see it went back to pink. Um, so it definitely went back, it's still a little bit warm, but it pretty much went back to um, that pink color again after I let it cool down and I added some of the water to it. Let's answer these questions now. Okay, so um, when we put the flask on the hot plate, what do we expect? We would expect that it should increase the temperature, which means we should favor the products. So favor the products. Why? Uh, because heat's a reactant, so adding it should, adding heat to an endothermic reaction should favor the opposite side. Should shift to the right. Okay, um, so our cool flask down, what do we expect if we cool it down? Well, that's like taking away the heat. That means you want to put it back. So it should favor the reactants because if you take away, you want to put it back. Put heat back. And since heat's a reactant, it should favor the reactants again. And what if we add HCl? Well, we're gonna try this. So if we add HCl, okay, so this might be easier if I kind of set it down, but I've got some hydrochloric acid. This is just a one molar hydrochloric acid. Now the idea is, if we take a look at the reaction here, the hydrochloric acid is gonna split up into H plus and Cl minus. So really I'm adding Cl minus. And if I add that, that's a reactant, it should favor the products and go back to blue. So let's take a look and see what happens when we do this. Okay, I'm gonna have to mix it up a little bit. I'll just add it, um, instead of adding drop-wise, and a little bit more just so that you can see pretty quickly here. Okay, so I'm starting to see it. I don't know if you're starting to see it, but it's definitely going back and getting darker again. And so it's turning to a deeper, like bluish purple color. And so if I keep adding this hydrochloric acid, it will eventually go back to that purple color. You will be doing a lab with this, so you'll be able to see on your own as well how this works out. Okay, so let's come back here. All right, so we said, what do you expect? Well, since it's a reactant, it should favor the products. Why? Because adding a reactant will shift in the opposite direction. Adding reactant shifts to the right to make more products. What if you add H2O? Well, it is a liquid. The thing that we would expect is because water is a liquid, 
we would expect that nothing would happen. So um, nothing to happen, why? Because water is a liquid. Now, if you add enough water, and then since the water is on the product side, it should shift to make the reactants. Um, enough in reality, in reality, enough water will give us products or reactants again. We'll shift left. Okay, I hope that helped you out and that you understand and have a much better idea of Le Chatelier's principle now. Happy day to you.